Hello there. Happy Tuesday evening. I'm starting to record this right around 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday evening, right before um, I get ready to make my dinner for the evening. I figured I would get this out of the way, upload it, do some editing. Oh, well, do some editing and then upload it. Um, we have a lot to get to for today's episode. Josh Yoli dropped a bombshell of a report on The Athletic uh, Tuesday morning with updates on Crystal Tang and Evgeny Malkin and a whole lot more when it comes to the Pittsburgh Penguins. We're going to get to all of that for today's episode. It's probably going to take up the entire episode. Um, if it does not, uh, I will also have a season review of Redeem Zahorna and what I expect from him going into next season. But you know, to start off, we're going to go into what Josh wrote about Evgeny Malkin first, then Chris Letang, um, potential fallback options if both are not able to come back, why Ron Hextall is you know, really not doing too well, at least as of right now. Um, and we'll get to a whole lot more uh, in that article. So that's all coming up right after this drop. Your Locked On Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. You're going to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can also follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins. So let's just jump right into this. You know, I I, I work pretty early on Tuesdays. I I start at 9, go till 6. I usually am up by, I don't know, 8.40, 8.45. I have my cup of coffee. I, I open up my laptop. I get ready to start my day. And that's when I see Josh Joey's tweet out. And I'm like, okay. This is either going to be A, really good, or B, really bad. There's really not going to be anything in between. Um, that's just you know, how it's been with Penguins um, news with both of the last two general managers. Um, and, you know, I think this update, you know, fall into the latter. It was really bad. And Josh started out the story by saying, Numerous agents have told me that after conversations they've had with Ron Hextall, they believe it is unlikely that Evgeny Malkin is returning to the Penguins. Some people I have spoken with in the Penguins organization feel the same way. He says Hextall is willing to sign him at a certain price. However, sources says the two sides haven't been speaking regularly after initial talks. Um, haven't been speaking regularly um, after the season ended on May 15th. People who speak with Hextall on a regular basis are very much under the impression that Malkin's return to the Penguins is no sure thing. Okay, a couple big things from that. The fact that they're not even speaking on an everyday basis is really bad. There's two weeks until free agency. Um, I know Chris Letang is your number one priority, but... You know, what he wasn't he still your number one priority when you went out and signed Brian Russ? Those contract talks were never closed. You had no problem agreeing to a six year term with him for a little over five million per year. I, I don't understand, you know, what's what, what's different here, um, in, in this case. And, um, you know, the fact that you know, I, I'm fine with a certain price thing. I, do I think Evgeny Malkin is worth eight million per at this point? No, I don't, but I feel like you can come to at least a, a you know, to terms that it's going to be a three-year term, but you know, if you're not willing to pay seven million per for him, I mean, there's going to be plenty of teams that will on the open market. He's just got to. Ron Hextall needs to stop being cheap with that sort of stuff. I know I don't have you know the numbers in front of me here, um, and you know he's going to probably keep everything quiet. And I don't know if it's ever going to leak out unless Elliot Freeman or one of the other insiders do some digging. But the fact of the matter is you know, that it's. It's kind of laughable that, well, I'm going to stick to my certain price and I'm going to potentially, you know, play hardball with one of the five best players to ever play for this franchise. It's a joke. You know, I, I don't understand what he's doing in that regard. If you are not willing to at least pony up $7 million per to play Evgeny Malkin for the next three years, you probably should not be a general manager in the National Hockey League. Full stop. I mean, that's, that's stupid. You know, I think that is a fine contract for him three times seven if you can get him maybe for three times 6.5 i think that's doable too if you have to go a little over seven hint hint 7.1 million because of course it makes 8.7 million per year i think you could probably get that done there um you know it's just this is really bad if josh's reporting is pretty accurate here that the two sides are not talking on a regular basis when there are only two weeks left until free agency opens um <clears throat> um that, that's mainly you know the big uh, Malkin news from this. And, you know, it, you, you hear the same P 
people in this fan base that, you know, underrate Evgeny Malkin. Well, he's too old. You can't pay him that much money. He's he's already declined. He's he's a power play. My favorite one from the, the, the very loud minority part of the fan base, he's a power play specialist. You can't pay him. But yet, when the power play stinks next year, if he doesn't come back, those same idiots are going to be the ones saying, well, why does the power play suck? Well, <laughs> when you lose Evgeny Malkin, your power play is going to hit the crapper. You know, he's sure. Is he not as good as he once was at even strength? Yeah, I have no problem saying that. But I mean, at the end of the day here, he, he still is a very good player for this team. Elite on the power play, still fine at 5v5. Um, I just, I, I can't wait to see if he does not come back and the power play does stink. When, what are those fans going to say now? I, I, I'm waiting for all those tweets. Well, I wish we had Evgeny Malkin. It's like, yeah, gee, I tried to tell you that probably about 1,500 times um, <clears throat> during the offseason. So um, <clears throat> that that's going to be honestly hilarious. And, you know, <clears throat> to go off of that a little bit, those same people, that very loud minority part of the fan base, they are just like waiting for the team to stink for some reason. And honestly, Adam Gretz of Pro Hockey Talk in Pittsburgh, he said it best today. There seems to be a segment of the fan base that actively wants the Penguins to get worse and be bad before they need to, and it makes no sense. They will also be the loudest in the room when the team does stink. And what I say to that, exactly. I 100% agree with Adam's assessment right there. Um, I, I don't know why people want to make change for the sake of making changes. I've probably said about 100 times um, throughout the um, offseason here. Um, <clears throat> and I'll say this. You know, if you are one of those people <clears throat> that is saying that the Penguins should get rid of the two core players and one of them because, well, they haven't won in the first round in the last four years, I I hate to say this, I don't know if you have a basic understanding of how this sport is, especially in the playoffs. I think you need to do a little more research before you give your take on something like that. The playoffs are super freaking random. The last couple of years, they have gotten boned by horrific goaltending. Malkin has literally been a point-per-game player the last two seasons in the playoffs. Latang has also played pretty fine. You know, the Montreal one, I mean, that's five months after the season ended. I don't really care about that one. The Islanders won. The team just wasn't that good. You know, people will say the argument that, well, you know, what's the definition of insanity? And it's just like, that, that doesn't apply here because these are two world-class talents who still – you know, are really good at what they do on this team. So no, I'm not going to listen to the argument that, well, they got to make change for the sake of it. And, you know, you can't keep bringing the same guys back because they haven't won a round in four years. Yeah, I can bring those same guys back because they actively help you win games. I would rather have those guys be back and have a chance at winning a round than not have those guys back and then miss the playoffs. Because, you know, if both of them do not come back, there is a real shot that the Penguins do not make the playoffs next year. And if that does happen, I, I honestly, I mean, I'll, I'll obviously be sad, but I will be kind of laughing at those people who said that they think the team will be better off without one of these two players. It's just, um, it, it's absolutely hilarious to me. Um, last thing before I get to a commercial break here, Josh says, Agents often find Hextall frustrating to deal with, which isn't necessarily an insult towards the GM. Giving agents players what they want can create a quick road to disaster. Hextall is being stingy with Malkin and Latang in regards to what they want. Many agents around the league have also confirmed that Hextall isn't likely to give the contract lengths that free agents on the market are demanding. Okay, hold up. So, A, he's being cheap with two of the best players in the franchise history, yet he had no problem going out and signing Jeff Carter to that really bad contract. And he had no problem going out and giving four years to Brock McGinn of all players, who I, I'm a fan of, but that's just ridiculous. And he doesn't want to give out big contracts to free agents to replace those players. What is the plan here? You have to have a backup plan in place in case you can't bring back one or both of these players. What are you doing if you are not willing to go out and spend your money in free agency? I understand that he ha he is known for being a bit passive. He's patient from his Philadelphia days, but this is a different situation. You are the general manager of the Pittsburgh Penguins, a team that spends to the salary cap every freaking year. You have an ownership group that mandate has mandated you to keep 
contending in the Sidney Crosby era, and you're not willing to go out and sign free agents to deals where the market is demanding, even though one or both of, of, of the two, two of the core players are potentially going to walk. I mean, I mean, what's going on here? And, you know, as for, you know, I'll get to Latang in just a second, but, you know, for Malkin, you know, there definitely are options out there. And I know nothing is guaranteed in free agency, but you're telling me you're not even going to try, you know, to go after someone, even if he can't come back. It's just, I, I don't know what is going on in his head there. Um, you know, this is, the, the vibes are definitely not there for me, um, to say the least. I was very disappointed um, to read that, that's for sure. And, you know, Josh goes on to write here. He knows that this team only has so many years with Crosby playing on a dominant level, and he seems apparent that he doesn't want to dish out lengthy contracts that could hinder the rebuilding movement whenever it arrives. But my argument is that it really wouldn't hinder the rebuilding movement because you can probably, you know, get something in return for anyone you sign in free agency and, and eat half the cap. I mean, it, even if you sign someone to replace either Chris Tang or Vinny Malkin, you can potentially trade them down the road and eat some of that cap and still get a decent, you know, return in that trade. So I don't really think it would hinder the rebuild at all. And in fact, I think it would accelerate it, um, at, at least in my opinion. Um, but I just, I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm really disappointed after reading that article, you know, I know some of it is definitely uh, pure speculation, but you know, the nuggets that Josh did drop so far, um, it's it's not the greatest, uh, to say the least here. But um, I still have a lot more to get to um, from this article for the Locked On Penguins podcast. We have updates on Crystal Tang, Vincent Trocheck, JT Miller, potentially Mark Andre Fleury stuff. Who could be the odd man out defensively? I have all that coming up a little later on in this episode. But before I get to that. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and your sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. BetOnline is your continuous source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. You can head to the website today or use your phone to learn more about the trends in action. That has been online where the game starts. All right, I'm back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can also follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I apologize if I was a little all over the place in that first segment. I was trying to tie up everything from the Evgeny Malkin stuff and just the Ron Hextall stuff in general. Um, now, let's get to the stuff on Chris Tank. Josh says they very much want to sign him. They believe he remains a number one defenseman despite being 35. And given his training, they believe he can remain elite for a long time. Hextall is also aware that no one on his current roster can replicate the minutes that Latin can handle. They like Marino, but they don't have the notion that he's the Penguins' next number one defenseman. They also like Mike Matheson, but they feel the same way about him as they have with Marino, that he can't be the next number one guy. Um, he talks about John Glingberg, but the Penguins know they'll be overpaying for anyone they land once free agency begins. So they have offered him a three-year deal. It sounds like Latang is not interested in that. He wants something five years, a little more um, of $8 million per year, perhaps as high as $9 million. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. Both sides are going to need to compromise a bit to get this done, but make no mistake, Hextall wants to bring him back. Okay. So <clears throat> the three-year term I'm fine with. I think they want to have that number <clears throat> be high for that shorter turnout term, but I, I also think they want all three to go out together at the same time, which is what, 2025, the 2026 season, I think. Um, that's when all three would be at UFAs. I think they would probably all retire at that point, or at least you know, maybe one of them comes back. Maybe Sidney Crosby comes back on like a one-year contract or something, and then, you know, Evgeny Malkin goes off back to Russia to retire, and maybe Chris Tang calls it her career um, <clears throat> at that point. <clears throat> but that's what at least it sounds like for me. I think they all want to go out together. But, you know, Latang, he has every right to ask for a five-year term. He feels like he's outplayed his last contract. He just had the best season of his career. You know, I have no problem with him seeking what he is worth, either from the team or just in general, you know, when he's set to hit free agency in a couple of weeks. Now, north of $8 million, you know, that, that's when it starts to get tricky. I've openly said on this podcast, I would be willing to do four times eight, five times eight for him, maybe a little more. Now, when it comes to $9 million, I think that's a bit steep. Um, I, I will openly say that. I don't know if he, I don't think he's worth nine million 
at this point in his career. I know Darnell Nurse, but just went out and signed an eight times nine point two five million dollar deal with Edmonton Oilers. That was a ridiculous contract that he is not worth that money, to say the least. I know Dougie Hamilton just went out and signed a big contract for over eight million per. You know, I, I think Latang is definitely worth over eight million. But you know, <clears throat> if he's asking for something like you know eight times, eight times, five times eight point eight or something like that, I just I don't know if the Penguins can really stomach that because you know say he does really decline you know what, what happens there you know what happens to that contract to say the least obviously the devil as advocate would, would be you know do they have any choice who are you going to get to replace them and you know i, I do fall in, in that you know line of thinking mostly because there's no one on the free agent market that can do what he does on a nightly basis i mean point blank i mean i've been having that argument um throughout all offseason the numbers back it up um, compared to all of the free agent defensemen, Chris Tang is the cream of the crop, um, and, and it's not even close <clears throat> in my regard. So, you know, it's a, a, as Josh writes, um, so b- both sides are going to need to have a compromise to get this done. Maybe Latang takes a shorter term, like three to four years. Maybe the Penguins are able to get that AEV down to say, you know, seven point seven to seven point nine. You know, maybe a little less than that. You know, upwards of eight million. Um, if they can do that, you know, I, I, I'd love it, but you know, I think with the Brian Ross, it's going to have to be similar to the Brian Ross contract. Obviously it won't be like 5 million per for the tank, but you know, if you can, you know, cause, cause Rust wanted the term, but the number he got, he, he could have gotten a lot higher in free agency. So, you know, it's going to have to be, you know, c- kind of similar to that, but for the penguins, they want a shorter, shorter term, but a potential higher number. So, We'll have to see with that. That's definitely at least a little more encouraging than the Evgeny Malkin news. You know, they're still 15 days away um, from that, but you know, they they, they got to start nailing these down. You know, this is we're, we're in crunch time here, to say the least. Um, next up on the list here, so Josh writes the Hextall and Burke. They don't hold POJ in the same regard as Jim Rutherford did. Still, they don't dislike him, and it's time for him to become an NHL regular. To make room for him, though, a current NHL defenseman needs to be traded. It's the big ones, Marino, Pedersen, and Dumoulin. And this is the big kicker. A source within the Penguins organization said Pedersen is the player the Penguins prefer to move. They don't dislike him, but there are factors moving against him because Marino is right-handed, even though Dumoulin didn't have a good season. Um, apparently, Chris Thang loves playing with him, and the coaching staff remains very comfortable with him. I mean, <laughs> I'll stop right there and give my thoughts. It is honestly hilarious that... You, I can sit here and read that nonsense that Marcus Pedersen should be the odd man out when he literally had one of the best seasons of his career this year playing next to John Marino. I don't know what the Penguins coaching staff as a whole is watching and the Penguins, you know, management regime is watching when they're thinking that Pedersen should be the one that should be moved over someone like Dumoulin who had a much worse season. I understand that Dumoulin and Latang are a very good pairing together. You know, Dumoulin covers up for Latang's mistakes. I think Tanger is very comfortable playing next to him. And he's been playing with him ever since 2015-16. But that said, you can probably still sign, you know, a Brian Dumoulin code in free agency, Kof Kof and Nikita Zadorov, that can do what he does at a higher level, especially with how he played this year. And you can move Dumoulin in a trade, and I think you can definitely get something decent back from him. I touched on my Monday episode. Nick Letty, for example, he went for a second-round pick twice when he was traded. The Islanders traded him to Detroit. Detroit traded him to St. Louis. You know, he got a pretty hefty return there. So the the, the Penguins, they will have an opportunity to get a decent return for him. It's all a matter of, you know, do they want to trade him? Um, And, you know, you can shed that $4 million. I don't think you're going to have to retain salary. But I just – I don't know what their player evaluation – how do I want to say this? You know, it's their player evaluation is definitely different from how I evaluate Brian Dumoulin and Marcus Pedersen, especially because, you know, numbers wise, Pedersen was a lot better. I thought he was smoother um, defensively and in transition. He was being a, a lot better offensively towards the end of the year. Dumoulin, he's never been known for his offense, but he struggled with his foot speed. Defensively, he was not covering up, you know, for some of the tank stakes that he used to do. Um, and honestly, he just, he just his net front defense was also really bad, to say the least, too. And, you know, I just, you know, outside of that one glaring error in the playoffs, Game 7 against the Rangers, I really can't think of a, a big mistake that, do, that Marino and Pedersen made as a pairing this season, and especially in that series. 
Um, I just think the Bengals are going about that the wrong way. Um, you know, if they're, again, if there's one to trade, um, it is Ryan Jumlin. And I am all for POJ getting a spot on this team or him proving that he belongs on this team. But when it comes at the expense of Marcus Pedersen, who quite literally just had the best season of his career, I just, I, I disagree with that line of thinking um, to say the least. Um, Josh, uh, you know, he go, there's, there's, there's quite a few things um, to get to for our final segment of the, the, uh, the locked on penguins episode for today. Mark Andre Fleury, Vincent Trocheck, JT Miller, um, there's a Drew O'Connor tidbit in there. I'll, I'll just throw that in here. Sounds like he's going to be given every opportunity to make the team <clears throat> out of training camp, which is what I was talking about on my on Monday episode. I would be kind of stunned if he was not on the opening night roster next year. So keep it right here on Locked on Penguins. I'm going to give my analysis on everything else that Josh writes uh, coming up here in this next segment. All right, I'm back here on this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can also follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins. So Josh does get into the Mark andre Fleury rumors. Um, he doesn't really say too much on this. I think this is mainly just speculation. It sounds like it's kind of unlikely, but the big tidbit here from Josh is that it sounds his sense is that um, from what he from what he's been told that Casey DeSmith might not be back next season. So that means they are going to have to go fill a backup goaltender spot. In free agency, there are options out there. You can get someone for cheap. Um, you know, if that ends up being the case, my thoughts on this, I'm fine with it. I think to Smith, he, he's a fine backup, but I think again, there are upgrades to be had there over him. You know, two seasons in a row now, he's been banged up towards the end of the year. Um, I, some of that is probably out of his control, but when the Penguins really needed him, you know, especially this year when Tristan Jari was out, you know, he was playing through an injury that just it, it got worse and. No, he he's also been very inconsistent at times. So if he does walk, um, I'm I'm totally fine with that, um, to say the least. Um, <clears throat> Josh also has a tidbits on Vincent Trocheck and JT Miller. Um, he says they're both Pittsburgh area people. I do think they would love the opportunity to play for the Penguins. Um, of the two, if you're talking about a Granny Malkin replacement, um, JT Miller is the better player, and it's not close. He just had the best year of his career, points wise, numbers wise. Um, um, he would have to be acquired via trade. Um, Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvey know the organization very well. I think it would have to be centered around someone like John Marino, though I'm not really sure if Ron Hextall would be willing to part with Marino. I think if it did come down to that and it was a potential one-for-one -one swap with some draft picks in there, some other stuff, um, I think I would probably do it because JT Miller is that good. And I understand he only has one year left on his contract, but I think you can make it work where he could – sign an extension next year. He he would probably be one of the only replacements that I would be comfortable, you know, trading for to replace Evgeny Malkin. You know, I'm not that big of a fan from Trocheck. He's going to want six times six. And honestly, Gans, if he weren't a Pittsburgh talent, if he wasn't from the city, no one would even be saying anything about him, to be honest with you. Um, I get that Trocheck's a two-way center, um, would be maybe a fine fit, but, you know, he doesn't put up the points that Malkin does. He doesn't drive offense the way he does. He wasn't that good in the playoffs for Carolina. Um, just go back and look at his numbers in the Rangers series. Um, people complained that Evgeny Malkin wasn't doing enough when he had six points in seven games this past year in the playoffs. Go look at what Vincent Trocek did in the two rounds against both Boston and Carolina. Uh, the, the, the cries from the fans, if that were Evgeny Malkin through two rounds, would be through the roof, to say the least. Um so I'm not a super – I'm not a big fan of, of, of Trocheck, especially on a six times six, six point five million per year. That's just – that's a buyout waiting to happen, um, at, at least for me. But, you know, JT Miller, I would be willing to move assets to get him um, if it does come down to Evgeny Malkin being uh, – or going to a different team, to say the least. Um, has some tidbits on Ricard Raquel. Um, I, I personally don't think Ricard Raquel – is going to come back to this team. Um, he's probably going to want, I think it was being rumored that he wants a four year, four, four times four, four times 4.5 and a little over that. Um, I, I touched on this on my Monday episode. I think 4.5 is a little too steep for him considering, you know, where he is at this stage in his career. I don't think he's ever going to score 30 again. Maybe he scores 20 for you next year, but you know, is he, you know, can he do that for the next four years considering where he is aging guard wise? I'm a little bit skeptical 
um, with that. And the funny thing is, you know, Josh writes, the Fenway Sports Group, they're not interested in any kind of rebuild. This is an ownership group that wants to win right now. Expect plenty of transactions this summer. Yet that goes against kind of what Josh was reporting earlier in the article where he was saying that Hextall is kind of against going out and giving a lot of money in free agency. So I don't know where a lot of these transactions are going to come from. Are they just going to make a lot of trades? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of moving parts, I think, right now for the Penguins. I mean, this is, <clears throat> to, to sum this all up, this is probably one of the most pivotal points in this franchise's history. Everything that they're about to do this offseason is going to shape where this team goes, not for the next couple of seasons, not for the next five years, but for the next 10 to 15 years, to say the least. Um, and I just, I don't think Hextall is capable of handling it. I really don't. I'm definitely a bit sour on him right now. Um, I don't think it, he has what it takes to negotiate these kind of deals with franchise icons. Um, I'm tired of him. You know, it sounds like he's just being cheap and all that, that, that that's not going to fly here. You know, this isn't the Pittsburgh pirates here with Bob nutting, you know, throwing his money around and you know, other owners around sports just being, you know, cheap with their cash. You know, this is the Pittsburgh freaking penguins. They spend up to the salary every year. Ray Shero had no problem giving let's hang in Malkin what they wanted last time around. <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't see why, no, Hextall should be any different here unless it's like something really, really outrageous, to say the least. And again, you know, I, I said this on my Twitter day. I'll say it again. Um, I love the fact that they went out and overpaid for 38-year-old Jeff Carter, yet they're playing hardball with one of the five greatest players to ever play for this franchise. Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, it's just it, it's silly season. I know, again, a lot of you know, the story was, you know, some, some of it is definitely pure speculation, but there's definitely, I think, a lot of factual info in here and you know we're, we're going to have to see if all this comes to pass in two weeks you know uh, this is going to be very this is a busy time coming up yens drafts next week for agency starts two weeks from wednesday um there's going to be a lot of news coming for this team and i hope you keep it right here on locked on penguins i'm going to have everything right here for you all i'll be the first to have it um i'll get my analysis on twitter then i'll go live either on the youtube page or i'll just record something um this is we're, we're in crunch time now and I'm really curious. I'm curious, but I'm also nervous as to what's going to happen going forward to the penguins. They cannot afford to screw this up. Um, so I think I said everything I wanted to say for this episode of the locked on penguins podcast. I will be back with another episode on Wednesday. We will have more season reviews. I know I didn't get to the redeems, redeems or one to one today. I will get that. One, I will get to that one on Wednesday and if there's any breaking news that happens with regards to the Penguins, um, I will get to that as well. So thank you all so much for listening. Let me know what you all thought about my analysis. Uh, you can comment on the YouTube page, send me a DM on social media, and leave a review. All that jazz. You can follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter, Ellen or Penguins. And of course, um, thank you all for listening. I'll be back on Wednesday. <laughs>